Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Um, this morning's uh, devotion is called um, Pray for Love. Um, something that's been on my mind for a while. And um, last week, John focused on revival and uh, encouraged us to consider and pray uh, to God about our, about our care in claiming God's promises. Um, and one, uh, one is to know his love. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll focus on that this week and pray for his love. And I've also got a reference to show you, which is um, Alistair Pegg's book on Pray Big. Some of you may be aware of that one. Um, I'll be quoting from that uh, later on. And also now, um, Alistair Pegg, in that, in that book, it, under the chapter seven, uh, he, he, he looks at the fullness of God. And he says, we cannot measure the love of Christ but we can observe its effects. That's quite powerful, isn't it? We can observe its effects. So uh, considering that, I, I've looked at the scriptures and uh, I realize as Christians, we need to look for and need divine assurance for our comfort. And this is how I believe we should approach the word of God. Let us then first look at how Jesus speaks about this to his disciples when he tries to comfort them in John 14 um, verses 15 to 21. So I'll read those. John 14, 15 to 21, where Jesus promises the Holy Spirit. If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The Spirit of truth, the world cannot accept him, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore. But you will see me. Because I live, you will also live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me. And I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. What a wonderful promise that is to the disciples of the Lord. Um, we don't hear this kind of language in the Old Testament very much. Uh, in the Psalms, maybe you could find some Psalms similar language. Uh, also, Song of Songs, I think, you know, the other thing that come to my mind. But consider, when we consider in Genesis, <clears throat> God made a covenant with Abraham. Uh, but Abraham and his descendants had to keep this faithfully as a command this was a covenant in the flesh um, and regarding male circumcision of course and ultimately a sign of their identity as God's people and they were expected to keep the law of God in that regard but righteousness was credited to him for his faith in God whilst he was still uncircumcised and it remains the same for us today we need to bear that in mind we, we, however, are circumcised in our hearts by the Spirit of Christ. The law of God is therefore already written on our hearts. God says that. The question I have here is, we are, are we displaying the evidence of this as we should be? Uh, therefore, we need to pray for love. I'm sure we all know that when Jesus summoned, uh, summed up the commandments to the Sadducees and the Pharisees, uh, within the law and the prophets he said to fully love God and to fully love thy neighbor as yourself I'm not quoting it I'm just summarizing it uh, and they failed to do this um, that's why he mentioned it they failed to do it it was impossible for them and we know that because they didn't have a changed heart Jesus however puts a more personal demand upon his disciples to love him by keeping his commands so, did he mean the Ten Commandments, which a lot of people seem to think, or the whole law, or whatever? That is a question. Well, let's go back to John 13, the chapter before, where Jesus answered Peter. He said, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then the Lord Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. And Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need, not, need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. 
and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not every one was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Now, Jesus cl clearly states um, that you will be blessed if you follow his example. And his example, despite being our teacher and Lord, is to be a willing servant. Once we are cleansed by him, our response is to be a willing, humble servant, most of all. This may seem rather lowly and simple, but we are told in John 1, 5, 3, in fact, this is love for God, to keep his commands. And his commands are not burdensome. We don't want to complicate that. The relationship that God desires with us is paramount. I've said it before, is to be holy, to participate in the divine nature. So we need to pray for love. We need to pray about love. If we return to our original passage in John 14, we're clearly told Jesus will not leave us as orphans, verse 18, but will come to us. He wants us to live, verse 19, and to love by showing himself to us, verse 20. We were reminded in our previous devotion that Jesus is the true vine and we are the branches. So if you still think as an orphan, then pray to God for his love. May I encourage you to do that. Cling to these truths and bear the fruit of the Spirit by pursuing righteousness, because that is what we're told to do, and without which no one will see the Lord. Some examples to help us in that are Romans 3.22. This righteousness is given through faith. Jesus Christ, sorry, faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Romans 9.30. What then shall we say? that the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained it, a righteousness that is by faith. Look at Paul's final charge to Timothy as well. In 1 Timothy 6, 11, he says, But you, man of God, free from all, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance and gentleness. 2 Timothy 22, 22 Paul also says, Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Now, all those verses um, have references to righteousness and faith, like two peas in a pod. They're pretty clear, aren't they? Now, it would be very difficult to live in such ways without behaving as a humble, loving servant of God. This is how his adopted children are to be. I've heard numerous stories of on a various situation in churches, and you probably do as well, where the so-called Lord's people are anything but humble, willing servants. In fact, they are quite the opposite. So how can such people expect God to bless them when they are blatantly ignore the word of God in this way? Rather, they will most probably experience his loving discipline in the hope that they will repent and learn to pursue righteousness, which is by faith in Jesus Christ as we have just read. So may I encourage you in that. Ephesians 1.5, he predestines us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. Adoption is a legal term applied to a lifelong established relationship. In the case of a Christian, it is to become a child of God in a close father and child relationship as an heir who is loved secure and provided for in every way eternally. One of the best passages I have read on this, I intend to quote before I finish very shortly. <clears throat> My friends, we are to know what it is to be adopted. We are to partake of this relationship by faith in Christ Jesus. So let us do so with every assurance and confidence from here on in. This is why I say to you, pray for love. Love 
the love of God that he promises to those who love him. Get that simple thing sorted in your heart and mind. Now, Jesus, um, the purpose of the gospel, I remind you, in uh, John 20, verse 31, is that these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And the last bit, I think, is very relevant. And that by believing, you may have life in his name. Again, this is referring to uh, loving him, knowing him, and getting to know him even more. So we should pray for love, love for Christ, love for God. Now, having you, give, having you given a, a bit of a taster at the beginning, I will finally refer again to Alistair Begg's book, where I'm going to quote a passage from there, which I think is very enlightening, very helpful. Um, and it's page 81 and 2. It's not the whole the two pages, but it's about one page between those two pages. Um, and it really helped me, and I hope it will you too. So I'm going to quote this. Um, it, it starts off uh, where I'm starting. It says, um, in, the, in the fullness of God section, all of us have rested, uh, tested his patience to limits beyond extreme, and yet still he comes again and again, calling out, my daughter, my son, you're my child. I predestined to adopt you into my family. I made you, I sought you, I bought you, I love you, I'm with you. There is nothing greater than that, that can be known or heard or experienced, that this God is your father and that you are his child, that you can say you belong to him and are loved by him, that you can know you can come to him, can run to him, can pray to him. And this is what it means to experience the fullness of God. We don't enjoy increasing fullness through some mystical experience or supposedly life transforming spiritual right. I've lost track of how many times people have tried to help me by suggesting that somehow or other what I needed to have to happen to me was a kind of inward explosion or some single definite event. If you will only have this happen to you, if you will only have this done to you, if you will only come up here at the end of the service and have the minister touch you. When anyone offers that to me, says Alistair Begg, I, have, I was up for it because I wanted it. I want to know what it is to be filled with the fullness of God. And he challenges us by saying, don't you? But none, the, the more I read my Bible, says, the more I clearly realise that what I need is not an inward explosion, but an inward communion with God. I need the spirit of God through the word of God, among the people of God, to make the fatherhood of God and the love of his son increasingly precious to me. That's how Christ may dwell in your heart through faith. It's how you can know the unknowable love and how you can experience more fullness of God. There is an intimacy here, and it's not something that is simply cerebral or mechanistic. It is the work of the spirit leading us into an ever deepening response to God, causing us to wonder what we are, that we are God's children by adoption, bringing us to look to God as our father and enabling us to live as children of that father. So we can, we, we cannot uh, mean just the love of Christ, but we can, um, we can of, observe its effects uh, and that is how Alistair Begg explains it I, I found that very helpful very encouraging people do have experiences and I certainly know I've had those but they are not the key thing the key thing is that we know the love of God and we know the love of God through the word of God as the spirit of God helps us I pray that will encourage you because we need to pray for love because we need more love for Christ more love for people as we pray for revival what we really need is revival in our own hearts and minds. We need to ensure that we uh, are in that a close relationship uh, so that we may be humble, faithful servants of God through Christ. And I just want to encourage you to, to pray that that love, uh, God may uh, 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 enlighten you through the word of God more and more, because that is really what I think Christians need today. And we're so busy. We get so distracted, uh, but we need to spend perhaps more time in the Word and in prayer uh, on a personal level, uh, as well as in these meetings and things, 
And I just want to not accuse anybody, just encourage everybody just to do that because that's so important on a personal level. And so I end this devotion thanking you for listening and just pray that God will bless it to us all, including myself. Amen.